Hi, this is Carrie Morrison, and welcome to Heart Forward Conversations from the Heart. I met Mark Gale back in 2013 when, as a member of the Hollywood Forward Homeless Coalition, we were trying to make sense of why people with serious mental illness were languishing on our streets. Someone suggested I reach out to Mark, who came to our coalition and provided a primer on the LPS Act in California, the Lanterman Petrus Short Act, which you will hear more about in this interview. He was generous with his time to come to Hollywood, and he opened our eyes to how complicated these public policies are with respect to the manner in which our society, our systems, treat or care for people with serious mental illness. Since that time, I have considered him to be a mentor, and I call upon him often for insights or ideas. For the topic I wanted to tackle in this final episode of Season 3, how people with serious mental illness too often find their lives intersecting with our criminal justice system, I knew he was the right person to talk to. He comes into this place of deep knowledge through his lived experience as a parent with an adult child with a mental illness. By day, he is a financial advisor, but after the markets close, he throws himself into his role as an advocate. Mark is known for his passion to protect people with serious mental illness in the criminal justice system. If you listen to the interview I conducted with former district attorney Jackie Lacey, which was episode eight in season two, she specifically talks about how important it was to have voices like Mark representing families and the National Alliance for Mental Illness in the DA's Criminal Justice Mental Health Advisory Board in 2015. He also represented NAMI California on the Judicial Council's Task Force for Criminal Justice Collaboration. He is also known for his role in developing and training law enforcement around crisis intervention training. I wanted to end this season with this interview because I think so many of us never consider the plight of those living with mental illness who are confined in our jails or prisons. Out of sight, out of mind, But if we had a system that actually cared for people early, when symptoms first became evident, or a system that actually believed that people can recover from their mental illness, we would view incarceration as an indicator of system failure. Our LA County Sheriff's Department never signed up for managing the nation's largest mental health facility. That is on us. Be informed. Hi, this is Carrie Morrison, and welcome to the final episode in the season three of Heart Forward Conversations from the Heart. And I have been looking high and low for the perfect person to interview for this final episode. I really wanted to do something about the intersection of our mental health system and criminal justice system. And I am going to introduce that guest today. And it just serendipitously this morning, I opened up my Los Angeles Times front page, top of fold. The article says, mentally ill detainees get stuck in jails. Despite court orders, thousands found unfit to stand trial languish in state lockups. Today is uh, Wednesday, September 14th. And I texted our guest and said, How prophetic is this, that this is what we are going to be talking about today. So um, welcome, Mark Gale, to the studio and for this final episode of Heart Forward. Nice to see you again, Carrie, in person. In person, person. right. I don't think I've seen you in person for a couple years. (laughs) It's been a while. Yeah, so I'm so glad we could do this. So Mark, you know, you are the perfect person to uh, walk us through this today. I, I, have, I kind of consider you to be a mentor to me in, in what I've been trying to learn about the system going back to when I first met you in about, I want to say, I don't know, probably more than 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. And um, you have been a strong advocate for families and for others who have, in particular, confronted our criminal justice system. And you have walked the walk uh, by actually actively being involved in volunteering your time for policy change and important discussions. So we're going to take advantage of all that you've learned today in this conversation. But I want to start a little bit about how you wandered into this. This was certainly not something you might have anticipated 20 years ago, uh, but I know that it's through um, the experience of advocating for your adult son that you found yourself face-to-face with some of the issues we're going to be talking about today. Can you share a little bit about that? So, uh, you know, um, our son graduated fifth in his class in fifth grade. He was 
very gifted, very smart on the gifted track. He was a marvelous athlete. Um, you know, w- w- I was coaching baseball. You know, life was very normal that way. And I actually remember the day when my wife and I, and it was during a baseball game that we looked at each other and we said, what's wrong with him? There was a change. He wasn't the same. And that was when he was 12. Mm -hmm. And at about 13 or 14, he had his first two, as I look back, psychotic incidents. And, you know, I was sitting there with him while he was saying these incredibly insane things, uh, trying to figure out if he had taken LSD and he was having a bad trip or what was going on or what was wrong. But I remember saying to myself, I'm sitting there with my 13-year-old son saying, oh, my God, my son's insane. And um, and I couldn't deal with it at the time. I couldn't put my arms around it. And so, I ha- so there was obviously parental denial. And it's a very long, convoluted story. Um, and I think how it ties into what we're going to talk about today is that started him, his behavior at school changed. We did everything that parents do, meet with the guidance counselor, the assistant principal, behavior problems. He got in trouble with the juvenile court. You know, he started doing things. Um, there was a lot of theft, usually from us. We were usually his victims, and uh, he was getting in a lot of trouble. The um, And then he started disappearing mm. for weeks at a time. That is scary. I spent a lot of nights driving around at 11.30 at night uh, trying to find him. He, he, he would have been under 18 at that point. Oh, yeah. This yeah. is when he was 16 and mm. 15. And um, it, it was frightening, and I actually got used to going to bed not knowing where my kid was. Oh. It, it, you know, it was devastating for the family. It affected each of us differently. It affected me, my wife, uh, his younger brother. And um, and his sister, too, lived with us at the beginning of this. Uh, she's older. And the um, the behavior got more and more extreme. Um, t- we finally had to send him out of state to a school that was locked. When uh, we finally, by the time the funding came through, he was 17. So it's a long story. He came home. Now he's an, a legal adult over 18. All oh, hell broke loose. I had to ask him to leave the house six weeks after he got back. And he started getting in trouble. And in November of 2002, he got arrested. And uh, so I had no fast. I, I don't watch cop shows. I'm not a Law & Order fan. It's my wife that watches NCIS, <laughs> probably because of Mark Harmon. <laughs> the, you know, there was no interest in this for me, but um, I needed to find out what was going on with him. And we, you know, psychologists really weren't helpful. They said, you have a um, juvenile delinquent with a drug problem. Oh, my goodness. Nobody was talking about mental illness. My wife and I are... She starts reading books about bipolar disorder or this, that, and the other. You know, we're just trying to find something. And um, I finally uh, f- found NAMI quite by accident. And what is NAMI? NAMI is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Uh, it's a fantastic organization. It really saved our family. And as most people will tell you who go to their support groups and teach I taught family to family for a short time and went through the family to family course, saved our lives. I don't think my son might even not be alive today without the knowledge that NAMI imparted. And um, so now I was, I felt like I at least had a somewhat of a toolkit. Uh, and I, and it turns out my family to family teacher who, you know, Jim Randall mm-hmm. was uh, had a meeting down at Twin Towers. So my kid is on the fifth floor. What is Twin Towers? Twin Tower Correctional Facility is the maximum security jail of the jail system uh, that was really converted to place people with serious mental illness uh, across the street from Men's Central Jail. So here I am um, advocating. Uh, I couldn't get a doctor on the, on the phone. Once he got downtown... I, there were certain medications that really he did not do well on. I didn't need them experimenting on my kid. I just wanted to talk to the, a doctor. Back then, you could not get a doctor on the phone. I called 
five hours a day. I was on hold an hour a day for five days, screaming and yelling at people to put me through to clinical staff, to a doctor. Finally, after the fifth day I got through and was able to uh, do a message about his medication. And then uh, Jim was going to a meeting with some other NAMI members to advocate for continuing education for sheriff deputies. This is two th- early 2003. Wow. January wow. of 03. Almost 20 years ago. Yeah. And uh, and he says, you want to tag along? So I said, sure. And um, a wonderful man and Commander Mark Klugman was in charge of custody at the jail and finally said, well, Mark's come along. He's got a different problem. And he says, what do you want? I said, well, I want... Uh, 24-7 access for the public so we can tell the doctors that work in your jail about psychiatric history and medications and things like that. Well, we can't do that. And and we went back and forth for six weeks, two months. And he says, what do you need? I said, well, I, I want to just be able to fax in information to the doctors about my family. Because member. you think the doctors would want to know that information. Yeah. <laughs> Continuity of treatment. As a father, I felt it was my inalienable right to be able to give doctor medical history. Mm-hmm. It wasn't happening. It wasn't impossible. And uh, so that's a whole story of itself, of the back and forth with the sheriff's department. In the end, he called me one day at work and said, here's your fax number. And along with a person who was helping me with my son's case, remember, he was in, he was arrested in November of 02. He was in jail. I met uh, my dear friend Carla Jacobs, who was uh, a board member from NAMI National and a founding board member of the Treatment Advocacy Center, our criminal justice expert in California. So she's guiding me through the system and teaching me things as I go along. And Jim and Carla and I together wrote, we co-authored, my family member's been arrested, what do I do? Sort of a crisis file from arrest to arraignment and how to deal with downtown and the jail system. And then I developed something called the Inmate Medication Information Form, which is these tools are still on the sheriff's website. And after I became a board member with NAMI California, uh, we were able to expand the program and get it's, they're in at least 15 jails in California. And I suddenly realized one man could make a difference. You know? So that is an amazing story. You went from the person who's <laughs> reluctantly now pulled into this milieu. And what they didn't realize is that they had awakened a sleeping giant with you because once you get committed, you're committed all the way. And so, you know, we will circle back to your son at the end of this conversation. But I want to understand, now that you you, you found yourself in the space and people like Carla Jacobs mentoring you and learning about the systems over, over the next, you know, 15 years or so, you became known as more of an expert in this space. This, this is where you carved out your advocacy. And I, um, I just want to do a fast forward, um, since we can't cover all of that, but I had, you know, in the same podcast interview almost a year ago today, Jackie Lacey, our former DA, because I really wanted to unpack with her the story of the mental health advisory board that she created, which led to some pretty um, important policy changes. Um, She speaks so highly of you. And what she said was that bringing you into those discussions, representing the family point of view, was something that had never really happened in L.A. County before. Mm -hmm. What do you recall about that time and, and the role you played with Jackie's task force? Well, I want to back up just one little step before that. Sure. So a, a dozen years went by, all right? I moved my son. After my son was in jail four different times, totaling a year, uh, he had on and off his meds every 90 days for 10 years. Uh, he was homeless four times. So a lot of the things that we all read about or hear about, my family was living firsthand. And for a dozen years, NAMI advocates... Uh, friends of mine, we all advocated we needed uh, mental health courts because in 2003, I met Judge Stephen Manley from Santa Clara Superior Court. And here is a man who presented a different model of treatment court that I surely wasn't seeing in the Superior Court, you know, in my son's cases. And uh, so I knew there was another way to do it. And he was way ahead of his time. And he was advocating reform and change and that we don't do things right with the mentally ill and we need to change the way we do 
business and handle these he's, challenges. He's definitely a legend in this space. Oh, he is. And for a dozen years, we advocated for change, and we were basically told, forget it. Uh, there will be no specialty boutique courts in L.A. County. Uh, they sort of – I think they gave us uh, a gimme. You know, they they gave Judge Tynan a, a co-occurring disorder court, the COD court, gave him 50 FSP slots, and that was our one treatment court in L.A., and said, well, see, we're doing it, but we it needed countywide expansion. And um, I had helped run the walk, the NAMI walks. That was our big fundraiser every year. And Jackie Lacey had been there uh, as an elected official, and she had come and spoken, and we had met, and we had a mutual friend or two. And so I knew her, and I was always trying to have coffee with her. You know, Ms. Lacey, I, I've got some ideas I really want to share, and I pushed and pushed for six months, and Finally, one day, out of the sort of the clear blue, my phone rang, and and she said, "Hey, Mark, I, you know, I'd love to talk to you." I said, "That's great. When can we meet?" And she said, "Well, I had a meeting, and uh, with a few officials here in L.A., and we started talking about maybe convening a group, and but before we do another meeting, I really would like to talk to you. Can can you come down and?" She gave me an hour of her time, which is a lot. Mm -hmm. And we talked and really hit it off. And when I was on the NAMI California Board of Directors, I was our representative on the Judicial Council's Collaboration on Criminal Justice and Mental Health Issues Task Force. Really, really long name, but it was the best thing I ever did because here I was working with Judge Manley and 20 other judges and supervisors and the secretary of the prison system. You know, these were people who reported to the governor, and I found myself— uh, in this position, and we wrote, um, you know, and the staff and the judges, and, you know, I got a few of my ideas in there as well, 137 recommendations about building a system of mental health courts in California and how to treat people with mental illness and what would work and diversion programs and all that stuff. What year would that have been? That, that report, I believe, was <laughs> finished in 2012. Okay. I think, mm -hmm. you know, uh, if it wasn't 2012, it was 2010, but I believe it was finished in 2012, uh, which was right when I was turning off the board. So sure enough, I walk into the meeting and District Attorney Lacey has this report in her hand. She says, you ever seen this? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yeah. She didn't see your you name know, somewhere in the list. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I did a little bit. You know, uh -huh. I weighed in. Uh -huh. And um, and it was some, an amazing experience. And it was four years of meetings with – it wasn't just a few meetings. We met for four years and wrote these documents. And I, I give great credit to, you know, all the amazing judges and staff that worked on this. And um, – I was there to represent NAMI California and sort of the family member point of view. We had a peer with us as well. And um, so we talked, and um, she called me back the following Saturday, and she said, I'm putting together a group. I want you to come. Bring NAMI with you, because at that time, I wasn't on a board. I had no, I wasn't representing NAMI. I was just speaking for myself. And I said, sure. So uh, Brittany Weissman, who was a mutual friend of ours, mm -hmm. was executive director of NAMI LACC at the time, Los Angeles County Council, which became Greater Los Angeles County. So I called Brittany. I said, she said to bring NAMI with you. I'm bringing, you're my ED. I'm bringing you with me. And uh, and another NAMI member, Patricia Russell, uh, was also there. And we this was meeting number two, uh, which became her Criminal Justice Mental Health Advisory Board. Yeah. And At such an important contribution she made. I, I just see her as an extraordinary leader who pulled all that together. You know, I was pinching myself at these meetings because she convened the county, the criminal justice system of the county, and every silo was in the room. And she made what, – what was marvelous about it is she made a safe space, and she said, I want ideas. I want you thinking out of the box. I don't care if your boss is in the room and will disagree. I, I want the ideas, which finally led to, uh, you know, I mean, the implementation of the sequential intercept model, which became her document, the blueprint for change. Yes. So – and so let's let's do this. I want to – I want to set up that the reason we're talking today, and I think you have just now per perfectly articulated why you are s such the perfect person to walk us through these issues, is 
this is such a complicated system. And look at you have you have experienced it both viscerally as a family member, and then you've also experienced it intellectually with you know years of volunteer time that you have put into this. So you, you, we we want to try to extract from you today some information because I really want to I want to create a a context that lay people who may not otherwise Mm -hmm. have reasons to be involved with the criminal justice system might look at the LA Times article today and now listening to you would understand better the questions they should be asking or the, 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 the things that they should be pressing for from their elected officials. So, so let's, let me just ask you this question too often. Now people with serious mental illness end up in our criminal justice system and that is not, was not, in, it's like what they call trans institutionalization, right? Back in the day, mm-hmm. people ended up in institutions and now they've been trans institutionalized into our, our criminal justice system. Um, why is this happening? Um, set the context for why this trend just doesn't seem to be abating. In a sentence, because people can't gain access to the level of care that they need. Mm-hmm. The, um, You know, during that dozen years when I became an army member and got involved, my phone was ringing off the hook with from other family members, and they taught me what was wrong with the system. I didn't know. You know, I wasn't a UCLA researcher or anything. I, you know, I was experiencing the system in real time, just like all these people on the other end of the phone were. And uh, my name got out there. My phone number got out there. My phone was ringing off the hook. So it was really the families that taught me what was wrong with the system. I can't gain access to treatment. I can't, I can't get the level of care my loved one needs or my, my family member's been arrested. What do I do now? You know? So that's how I learned what the problems were. And I think for the audience, I, I'm going to, uh, draw a clock on my the imaginary virtual, whiteboard <laughs> my virtual whiteboard so I'm going to try to simplify this because it is a really complex subject so why are so many people ending up in jail uh, with serious mental illness and why is the system so badly messed up and there's really four huge forces at work all cr- um, taking their sort of magnetic pull in this one way or the other on the system. So if you draw a clock and you start at the top at midnight at 12 o'clock, you've got federal reasons, all right? And I'm just going to list one, which is called the IMD exclusion. So IMD is a term that came from the mid-60s when they created Medicare and Medicaid, where the federal government said, we don't want to pay for the state hospitals. We think that's the purview of the states. You're not going to get the Medicaid matching dollars to do that. States are going to have to fund that on their own. So we're going to create an exclusion in Medicaid. And any facility greater than 16 beds will receive no federal funding. That is called the IMD exclusion. And what does IMD stand for? Institute of Mental Disease, which is a terrible Terrible, name. Terrible name. Terrible name from the mid-60s, but it is stuck all these years. And that's what it's called. And uh, so any treatment facility was 17 beds or more. So when Dr. Sharon, over the last year or two, has been building this restorative village in the MLK campus downtown, he wanted to build an acute inpatient hospital for people to provide the highest levels of care. Which is desperately needed. Which we desperately need. Because of the IMD exclusion, he wanted to have 32 beds or a larger facility. Now, you would think we could build one building, put 50 beds in it, right? Have some economies of scale, a sustainable business model. That's not what happened. He had to build two separate buildings with two separate treatment providers, 16 beds each, right? Each with their own infrastructure, infrastructure, (laughs) uh, administrative costs. It's just nonsense. So what it does is it drives the scarcity of acute and subacute resources. So when I say acute, I mean inpatient psychiatric care in a locked psychiatric hospital. And subacute would be what we call an, a residential IMD. So imagine sort of a skilled nursing facility that's locked that um, uh, the county has to pay for because it's greater than 16 beds, right? Some of them are quite large. And where people who are conserved LPS law, it's like a guardianship, 
And the Office of the Public Guardian is now their conservator, and they are placed in a locked facility to be stabilized for maybe six months or a year, sometimes longer. And then once they are no longer gravely disabled and able to return to the community, they can leave that highly restrictive setting and move to a more community setting that would be unlocked and less restrictive. So what is the IMD exclusion? I mean, we don't have enough clinics, we don't have enough hospitals, and we don't have enough IMD beds for the people who were the most sick. Remember, these are the people who were the most seriously ill. So now we go to three o'clock, we'll go to the state level. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to simplify a very complex topic, topic, which is state funding, but we have two basic streams. We have the Mental Health Service Act, MHSA, which was passed in 2004, 1% tax on millionaires, and that money was designed to fund a new way of providing treatment to people with mental illness. Um, there was a lot of pushback on what they call the medical model, hospitals and things like that. And we wanted to use more therapy and more recovery-oriented principles where people would drive their own treatment instead of the doctors driving their treatment. It was a new way of thinking. And uh, uh, Mayor Steinberg, who was then Senate Senator Steinberg at the time wrote, passed this law with Rusty, a gentleman named Rusty Seelix and Rose King, and uh, they were going to provide services. But the the way it was implemented was that it was actually the act does not talk about voluntary or involuntary, but it was implemented in such a way that it was going to be voluntary only services on an outpatient basis. Which would kind of suggest that it would be people who were less than seriously mentally ill, perhaps. Maybe more moderate, yeah. mild to moderately mm -hmm. ill. I'm not saying that they don't use MHSA money for people who are very seriously ill, but not at the point where you would have to uh, put them in a psychiatric hospital. So, and then there was the old money which was a, the state had a specialty mental health carve out, 1991 realignment funds, 1991 mental health realignment revenue is what builds psychiatric hospitals, IMDs, clinics. The idea of MHSA was not to supplant the old medical model system, but to create a new system. Um, but the fiscal discrimination that's baked into the funding formulas, this is where you get into the weeds. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the last, five, six, seven, eight budget years, realignment revenue basically stays flat. Uh, I participated on an incompetent stand trial solutions work group, and one of the speakers who was the executive director of the California Behavioral Health Directors Association, Michelle Cabrera, actually said, Mark's right, we get less realignment revenue today than we got in 2005. So it's been about a billion two, and it's been that way. It's essentially funding is flat. But MHSA revenue, point to point over the last five years, probably up 50%. And I will point out that um, <laughs> the whole, even the word realignment, I, uh, you, you, I know you've listened to the podcast I did last year with Alex Briscoe, mm -hmm. who used to be the health director for Alameda County. And we talked about the public mental health funding system and how complicated he is. it is. And realignment, I said, it sounds like you're having your tires straightened on your car. It's, right. it's, but he kind of described it as more like a block grant where the state was, in a sense, divesting its responsibility, handing this money to the counties and saying, okay, now you, you do it. You do it. It's sort of a specialty mental health services carve out. Yeah. And um, so let's keep going to the clock. Now we'll go to the bottom of the clock. We'll go to six o'clock. And there is LPS law. So you hear that term all the time. It stands for the Lanterman Petra Short Act, the three uh, legislators that wrote the act. So in the bad old days of mental health, people were sent to a state hospital. There was no due process. People were detained inappropriately. And there was you couldn't get out unless a doctor would sign you out. You know, th th you couldn't. You couldn't get a writ and go to court and, you know, get a lawyer. There's none of that. And, and there were a lot of people who were inappropriately detained. So there was need for due process. There was need for that reform. Uh, but it also set a very high standard in order to put somebody in a restrictive setting. And, you know, what has occurred, through, I would call it the unintended consequences of an outdated law based on 1960s science, right? Mm. 
uh, and it doesn't work. And what it's done is act as a barrier to treatment because unless you, so you've heard the term danger to self, danger to others or gravely Grave disability, disabled. Right. All right. So you can be hospitalized for being dangerous, but if you want to, if somebody needs an LPS conservatorship, uh, you must be gravely disabled under the law. The definition is the inability to take care of one's personal needs for food, shelter, and clothing, a very high bar to meet. So people who are very, very ill who really need to be placed in a, a setting where they can be stabilized you know, and start to recover and then reintegrate back into the community often are, are, are uh, locked out because they can't meet this high legal test. All right, so now we've got federal discrimination on funding. We've got state realignment fiscal discrimination. Mm -hmm. All right, we've got the unintended consequences because uh, um, the authors of the LPS law did not want it to act as a barrier to treatment. They wanted it to facilitate treatment, but appropriately with due process. Uh, and now you ha you get to the county, and then you've got discrimination that occurs in the county. Because so we're at nine o'clock. We're at nine, nine o'clock, correct? Mm -hmm. And you know, because the local decision makers are going to decide where the funding goes. We get this money from the state of California. What are we going to authorize? What are we going to appropriate? So you and these are all intersected, and these are pushing and pulling against each other. And so you've got these massive silos, but it's still. Fiscal discrimination against the people who are the most sick. So that is a really helpful. That shows the interplay of those four different factors. And it's so just like a Jenga game. You can't just pull, you can't pull one out. No, the, 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 whole, the whole clock needs to function. They're all stuck together. They're all stuck together. Yeah. Are you able to tell me, like, we hear, we hear reports, for example, that L.A. County Jail is the largest mental institution in the country, basically approximately 5,000 people incarcerated. I don't know if, if you happen to have handy any of those trends right now with respect to, it's been impossible to make that number lower from what I understand. You know, it's been hard. When the county wanted to reduce the jail population, for instance, when the pandemic, COVID pandemic hit, they got a lot of people out of jail really fast. Excuse me. But um, getting people out to a placement when they don't have a mental illness is a much simpler proposition than taking somebody who does have a mental illness and putting them in an appropriate placement. You know, when people can't get the level of care that they need, the outcomes can be really catastrophic. If you can't get a bed in a hospital – and you're acting out and you're in crisis in the community sooner or later, you're probably going to come to the attention of law enforcement. Maybe you're walking down the street and shouting at people who aren't there, right? Or, or you're trespassing or sleeping somewhere that's illegal or urinating in public because you're homeless in a park and you get arrested, mm -hmm. you know, so you can't get a bed in a hospital. But, you know, um, I coined a phrase years ago, Jail is the bed that never says no. Mm -hmm. And they'll throw a cot on the floor and a mattress on the floor, and they will overcrowd the jail as much as necessary. The sheriff has no choice. He's got to take whoever comes in. Um, so, you know, that population continues to grow, frankly, because the mental health system is failing people right. with mental health. So, so I've been reading reports about the desire to close down men's central jail, which is considered to be, um, the conditions there are, are, are pretty horrific. And we won't necessarily talk about that today, but what I've learned is that when, when we are trying to lower the jail population, you have three kind of main techniques. One is to divert people from entering jail in the first place, like the guy you just mentioned, you know, uh, waving, uh, at people mm -hmm. in the middle of the road, uh, reduce the length of time people spend in the jail, or third, uh, provide a supportive reentry process as you leave jail, you reenter the community to avoid recidivating back into the jail. So let's talk a little bit about those techniques. I want to I want to work backwards. Let's start with reentry. Um, back in 2016, the LA County Board of Supervisors did something pretty novel. They created the Office of Diversion and Reentry, and I believe you were actually part of... I'm on the Permanent Steering Committee. Up for that. Right. So what was the intent of creating this? It's referred to as ODR. 
what did they hope to achieve? And um, if we didn't have ODR, where would people go as they reentered back into the community? Well, without ODR, the 2,200 people that have been helped by them and placed and many more that have passed through the system, uh, think how bad things would be right now if no ODR had never existed. So when District Attorney Lacey's office drafted the blueprint for change, gave it to the supervisors, they authorized, I believe it was $130 million to get this project off the ground. Uh, District Attorney Lacey had convened the county. Everybody was rowing the boat in the same direction. Everybody wanted to change the way we handled people with mental illness, uh, both at law enforcement level. This, and, you know, it, it would take a lot of time to explain the sequential intercept model, but there's sort of intercept zero, which is community services or the lack thereof. There's intercept one where that, say, a mental health team or law enforcement comes across somebody in the field who's having an episode and is in crisis and maybe get, people get arrested. And then there's Intercept 2, which involves the courts, pre-booking diversion programs. You know, do we really have to book this guy in the jail? He, he really needs drug treatment and mental health treatment. Maybe we should just get him to treatment. That's what a pre-booking diversion program, why criminalize him, mm -hmm. right? But that didn't exist until these ideas became uh, be accepted as common wisdom. And then intercept three, which is jail, you know, in reach into the jail, uh, trying to reach out to people and get them ready for intercept four, which is reentry, discharge back into the community, which requires services for people who are ill. And, and then finally intercept five, which is community integration. Mm. So um, the job of ODR, and I think, you know, I think we just wanted to make things better at the beginning. Uh, it's possible some supervisors saw it as a way that, uh, well, if we could do this well enough, we could reduce the jail down and then we could close Men's Central Jail because that was a big topic at the time. Uh, but you can't solve this problem on the back end. I mean, they are coming in the front door of the jail faster we can get them out the back door. Mm -hmm. So if you're just working on the back end of the system, you know, you're, you're mitigating all this catastrophe, but you're not stopping the inflow, you know, which brings you to the front end of the system. But your, your, your second point was how do you reduce the length of stay in the jail since we're going backwards? Right, right, yeah. You know, um, and that is really difficult. It, it depends. There are, Misdemeanors get treated differently than people can charge with a felony. Uh, we really don't have a robust pretrial services program. Um, and actually, tomorrow, Vera Institute of Justice is having an expert panel on pretrial services, which I hope to be able to listen to. And the... Um, and that's something the county is working on. It's like, how do we create pretrial services so... And it sort of comes in um, sync with cash bail reform. Why, while you're waiting to go to court to begin your trial, to, to adjudicate your case, do you really need to sit in jail? You know? So maybe you, that, that would be a helpful thing to kind of define right now. You, you've been arrested, um, and uh, there, there's going to have to be an assessment made at the time of, of intake uh, at right. the reception center. Um as to what what options the 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 jail might have, can you describe, uh, particularly as it relates to the notion of, of being declared competent to stand trial or not, or people who are how they might be treated differently if they are if they've been um, charged with a misdemeanor offense versus a felony offense? Okay, so when you're arrested in a metropolitan area the size of Los Angeles County. You're arrested in a particular part of the city. Let's say you're arrested on a Friday night. You go to the local city jail, which is basically a, a holding tank, right? And then on Monday, the buses take everybody downtown, and you go to inmate reception center first. And there, they try to discern, uh, you know, uh, what your needs are. Do you have any medical problems? Do you will you self disclose that you have a mental illness or not self disclose that you have a mental illness? Do you need medication? Maybe you have diabetes. You need insulin. All these kinds of things happen. And there's a whole triage. There's nurses in inmate reception, which right now is overcrowded and a complete mess. And uh, so that has to be discerned first. And then 
you know, I think we'll confine our conversation to people who have mental illness rather than all the different things that happen to people who just committed crimes and don't have a mental illness. So you you go into jail and you are offered treatment, but there is no mandate that you must accept that treatment. You have constitutional right to refuse in the absence of an emergency uh, in jail. And so people end up being there a long time. So under the Constitution, if you go to court, you have a constitutional right to be able to participate in your own defense. You need to understand what your lawyer is saying to you. If the judge issues instructions, you need to understand what the judge is saying to you. You need to understand about the evidence against you and, you know, the whole process, that criminal justice process. So if you are experiencing psychosis and you are really sick and you are unable to make sense of all that, then you are incompetent to stand trial, which is frankly a very low bar. Mm -hmm. It is very different than a more um, legal and medical definition of capacity to make informed consent. Those are much more complex and higher structures. Just that's really what competent to stand trial is. I can go to court and understand what's going on. So if you're incompetent to stand trial under current law, the public defender must, uh, the defendant's counsel must declare a doubt. Your Honor, I don't think this man or woman understands what's going on. I am declaring a doubt as to competency. And it's like hitting the pause button on the case. Now, nothing can happen. Because if you don't know what's going on, how do you Plea bargain. Does the judge try to, at that moment, intervene to, to test those assumptions or? No. no. What the judge will do at that point is if the public defender has declared a doubt, the judge will stop the trial and order a psychiatric evaluation. Okay. All right. And that starts another multi-week process. So meanwhile, this guy's still sitting in jail and there's a process they bring in an evaluator to evaluate and write a detailed explanation to the court. You know, and then that's where the judge gets involved with that. All right. And based on the evaluation, the person is either competent to stand trial, in which case you go back to. So in our county, we have a mental health court that just does those kinds of hearings uh, now based in Hollywood, mm -hmm. Court 95. But the uh, other counties do it a little differently. Um, so if you're declared competent, OK, you go back to criminal court and you continue on with your case. If you're incompetent to stand trial, a lot of changes have happened just recently. Very briefly, we used to, uh, when District Attorney Lacey's uh, work group convened, we had people who were spending a year in jail for a misdemeanor. They had committed some little offense, certainly not a public safety issue. There was no victim. Nobody got hurt, you know, and but they're incompetent. So they can't go to court. So like if, a total catch-22. So, so when you think of the expression, the criminalization of the mentally ill, it's an old term. Mm -hmm. It's the misdemeanant incompetent to stand trial, or what we call missed clients, mm -hmm. that to me is the very definition of the criminalization of the mentally ill. So um, we have a great judge here in L.A., Judge Jim Bianco, and he says, he says I'm going to volunteer to lead a work group for District Attorney Lacey's advisory board, and he put together – our MISS program. Mm. And we started getting people out by the hundreds, you know, of getting them out of jail and placed because there was no reason for them to be in jail. So placed in, in some type in of treatment, treatment facility. facilities. Right? We would put them in residential treatment centers. And, uh, the Department of Mental Health has ERS and rich residential services facilities. And we were doing that. Now, recently, a law was passed by Senator Henry Stern uh, Senate Bill 317, which did away with that of restoring people to competency in jail. The law, new law, said that's not necessary. Mm -hmm. These are misdemeanors. So now you're either going to get released, right, or and you'll be offered treatment. You know, here's a way to contact the Department of Mental Health. Maybe you're offered housing. Maybe you're just discharged with nothing. Depends on the circumstances. Hopefully you will be offered services. But then it's up to you whether you accept those services or refuse those services. Unfortunately, too many people or refuse those using, services. Yeah. For the felony incompetent to stand trial, those are people who committed much more serious crimes. The, um, the process is statutory. So under the statute, 
If you commit a felony and you're incompetent to stand trial, you have to go to a state hospital. We have five state hospitals and go through a formal restoration program to be restored to competency. And then once you're restored to competency, they send you back to jail and to continue your case because now you're competent. So that was always something that I, on my own learning journey here, because I, I, I learn something new every day. A few years ago, I didn't even realize that we still had state hospitals because I thought, oh, well, those were closed, you know, in the 80s or whatever. But no, you just said we have five. And it sounds like predominantly they are used for this process of competency restoration, which is why we refer to them as forensic state hospitals for the most part. Right. Well, about 70 percent of the population. So years ago, the you know, the wait, the wait list to get in was about 400 people, and it keeps growing and growing as the problem accelerates. Uh, the wait list, the last figures that came out in June, there's 1,921 people ahead of you to get into to the get state a hospital. bed at right. the state hospital. So meanwhile, you sit in jail, and people have sat in jail like even eight months, a year, 14 months. Uh, the average is around maybe five or six months. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's a terrible situation, and you're detaining people uh, in a, in a non-therapeutic environment. It's a correctional facility, and if you're incompetent to stand trial, you are very close to being the sickest of the sick. Yes. These are our people in our county who are our most challenged citizens. Uh, through no fault of their own, they have a very serious mental illness. They can't move forward with their cases. Um, you know, if people don't get the act, if you need access to higher levels of mental health care and you don't get it, there are five catastrophic outcomes that occur. You're going to end up in jail or prison or a state hospital, homeless and victimized on the street, or unfortunately, too many people die. Mm -hmm. Those are the five things that happen, and they're all awful. So since we're talking about length of stay, we're, we're talking about you know, the, the conundrum that L.A. County is facing with overcrowded jail system right now is you've got people there waiting for these precious beds in the state hospital system to be declared competent. And so uh, until and unless you could uh, generate m more beds in the state hospital system or, or find an alternative way to um, house people to provide that kind of restoration, we have a log jam in the jail. That's right. Okay. And it's happening all over the state. There are thousands. This is not just a few people. These are thousands of people, thousands of families that are being impacted mm -hmm. by people who can't get out of jail. That was the LA Times article today. Mm -hmm. was about, I'm in jail, committed a crime, and I can't get out. And... Um, you know, the problem is, is so serious, and it's just wrong to, to force people to stay in jail and not move forward with their treatment. So the ACLU filed a, a, a lawsuit called Stiavetti, um, NAMI Greater Los Angeles County. I'm criminal justice chair for NAMI Greater Los Angeles County. We signed on to uh, the lawsuit, and uh, which tried to force the state to say people need to move in a reasonable period of time, which was determined to be 28 days. At that point, when, when the California Supreme Court, uh, it went to appeal, it was upheld in appeal, the Supreme Court said, no, nope, we're not going to hear the case, so it's law. So they've given them till 2024 to try to get to 28 days. I don't think we're going to get there. The State Department of State Hospitals convened an IST, Incompetent to Stand Trial, Solutions Work Group, where par family members like myself participated, as well as all sorts of public officials, the people at the state hospitals, judges, everybody, anybody who wanted to participate. And then there was a formal committee that was appointed to make recommendations about basically how do we cure the waiting list? You know, how do we get people to move forward to their treatment, which they are entitled to? in a timely manner. And it's a mess, and a lot of good ideas came out. You know, as a family member, I listened to these ideas, and I said, if you knew this, why didn't we fix it five years ago? Right. You know, because, and I'll tell you why, because the state of California doubled down on something called jail-based 
competency treatment, JBCT. So four or five years ago, we have a, uh, an, uh, a state agency, the BSCC, Bureau of Standards of Correctional something or other, and the <laughs> – sorry, <laughs> one acronym I never can seem to remember. And, you know, for the last four or five years, we've been building four, 41 jails in California. 21 have JBCTs. So the state had already made a decision behind closed doors that they were going to double down on jail tra- Well, people don't get well in a cell. No. And people don't get well in jail. No, it's funny. I'll just uh, say tangentially, I do volunteer at Twin Towers, and I was talking to a guy there who had just returned from the state hospital, and he was awaiting his trial now. And he actually said that at the state hospital, I can walk around outside. I can be in the sun. Mm-hmm. There's, uh, you can choose uh, interesting things to eat in the commissary. It, it actually it sounded way more humane than he's now back into the cold, concrete, no sun allowed uh, life of Twin Towers. Um, all right, so that's such a mess. Um, so, so, so they're trying to, you know, reduce the length of stay, but using jail treatment instead of treatment. What I would tell you, and I advanced, tried to advance this idea with the county, and I is um, what we would call a forensic IMD, almost a, a, a locked skilled nursing facility type of facility. Think of it as maybe a county state hospital mm-hmm. where it's a secure facility, public's not at risk. Mm-hmm. These people committed in some cases, some very serious crimes. So you need a secure perimeter. Uh, but inside is a therapeutic environment. Right. It's a treatment facility, not a jail. We don't have one. So there are right now are 600 people in the LA County jail system who are felony incompetent to stand trial. I've watched it go from 300 to 400. Now it's 600. And if you talk to the docs that work in the jail, uh, they'll tell you, you know, and look, some of these people should only be restored to competency in a state hospital environment. Um, but there are others that could be put into a community setting. setting. Yes. Both locked and unlocked. Right. And actually, ODR does what they do so well that we started taking people who are felony incompetent to stand trial, putting them in unlocked community treatment centers, right, and – Providing them with treatment, they become stabilized, they become competent with really great success ratios. You're talking about, you know, 80% success ratios, 17% recidivism rate. We've done so well with it that the states took the original 415 slots and funded another 100. So we have 515 people. Well, if we can do that in L.A., can't people do it elsewhere? Yeah. You know, so that's one way of bringing. So the wait list for the state hospital is large. Could we restore some people here at home? So JBCT is one way. We contract out for 40 beds at West Valley Detention Center in San Bernardino. We're a county of 10 million people. We're contracting for 40 beds, but I don't really want people going to jail for restoration, but we do it. Uh, we don't have a forensic IMD. I hope someday we build one. Well, I think you just planted the seed for that. That's a really good. So let's let's move on because yeah. this this boy this problem is multifaceted. <laughs> I, I'm sorry if I'm I'm going on too. No, no, too no. Long, you're the, you're you're you're. It's planting. really complex uh, subject, but matter. super important as it is made the front page of the LA Times today. And 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 the last thing I just say in order to solve these jail problems, if we can't solve it on the back end alone, then what do we do on the front end? So this is what alternatives to incarceration, right? right? So mental health treatment courts, right? Right. right? So that 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 initiative of the alternatives to incarceration task force, which I know you were involved mm-hmm. with, as was Brittany, very much so, led to creating a, a division in the in the county under the CAO's office. So, what was the particular goal of ATI, as it's referred to? Right. So, so ODR was funded. Uh, You know, the Blueprint for Change report was delivered to the supervisors in 15, took a while to ramp up an office. ODR sort of got going in 2016. 
Uh, as part of that, NAMI got very involved in making presentations to law enforcement. We bring in family members like myself and peers who have a mental illness, and we speak to law enforcement. We speak to sheriff deputies. We speak to police officers. And it's empathy training. Mm-hmm. We're saying, here's what it's like to be a person with mental illness or the father of somebody with a mental illness. And it brings an emotional impact to a formal training program they're getting. And CIT, Crisis Intervention Team Training, uh, think of it as de-escalation training. So if we police encounter somebody on the street, they want to de-escalate, not escalate. We don't want we don't want people getting shot. We don't want people getting hurt. We want people taken to treatment facilities if they need it. How do officers recognize that and respond appropriately? So that's CIT training, which is part of Intercept One. The, um, you know, so we got ODR going and the county wanted to move forward to a mission, what they, we call care first, jails last. How are we going to do that? Mm -hmm. We need a roadmap and we need community stakeholder involvement to figure it out. We're not just going to do it behind closed doors. So the ATI initiative started with the Alternative to Incarceration Work Group, of which the first 90 days were devoted very much to people with mental illness, and the three quarters of the year was devoted to people without mental illness and people with substance abuse issues. And we wrote recommendations. How do we get to how do we how do we implement the sequential intercept model? in the county of Los Angeles. So we do this right. We do this using all the research from around the country. And there's an initiative called the Stepping Up Initiative. You can Google it. And if people are interested in this stuff, if they go to the Council of State Government's Justice Center website, Hmm. it is the archive for all of this information. If you want to be read about law enforcement training or mental health courts or any of these things, incompetence stand trial, you will find research and real world stories uh, at the Council of State Governments Justice Center website, and they help communities do this. Uh, the Stepping Up Initiative is essentially a marketing campaign hmm. to senior county leadership to say, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. We've already invented it. All you have to do is implement it. And we're going to give you all the research and all the tools of how to do this. We're going to do a mapping process. We're going to look at your county and say, here are the resources you have. Here are the resources you need. Here's where the gaps are. Come up with a budget. Let's fund this. Let's get it done. And 500 communities around Has LA the County nation. done that? Yes. Okay, okay. They signed on to the Stepping Up Initiative, okay, okay. and they're doing it all over the country. So nobody's got to figure this out from scratch right. all on their own. There's a lot out there. And hopefully, you know, and the more we do it, the better off we are. The problem comes when the funding runs out, and that's where we are today. So um, we, we're going to have to start to wind this down. Um, I, I wanted, you know, people who listen to this podcast, again, are Joe Q public lay, lay people, but also elected officials, people running for elected office, um, members of the media. And so this is kind of your platform maybe at this moment to bring up maybe two or three of the top issues that you think are facing L.A. County right now in this space. Um, you and I did talk about this a little bit in advance, but one of them that is high on everyone's mind is trying to find a way to close down Men's Central Jail. Um, and how how this is complicated, why is this related to what we're talking about today, the intersection of people with mental illness and the criminal justice system? So there are a lot of complex populations in the jail. There are people who are LGBTQ. There are people who have serious medical problems. There are people who are sex offenders. There are people who have committed violent felonies. Uh, And there are lots of people with serious mental illness who may fit into any one of these categories. You need appropriate placements for people in, in order to close men's central jail. The But one of the things we have to do, because so many of them, thousands of them, um, you know, we the county in the ATI report basically said we need 3,700 placements in order to get everybody out of the jail system so the jail will be used with what it was originally intended for. If you're committing a crime and you go to jail, 
you know, it's not for people who are sick. Right. It's for people who are not sick. Twin Towers would be a more appropriate place for those who have committed right. crimes. Right. So people who are criminals who are serving four years of time or in, in the jail system, they should be in Twin Towers, not somebody with mental illness. People with mental illness should be in therapeutic environments. Mm -hmm. The um, And so the county, um, and there's a lot of politics being involved because it involves a lot of money, uh, has taken ODR OD, so part of part of the incentive to cooperate if you're an inmate and you want to get out of jail is you're offered a diversion program. So I'll put it in plain English, say, okay, we've cut a deal with the district attorney. They will agree to it. The judge is in agreement. You have to agree as the defendant that you will participate in a two-year program. You will go to transitional housing. Maybe there'll be 20 guys in a house, right? Mm -hmm. You'll start a treatment program. Uh, and you'll get transitional housing. You won't be homeless. And if you graduate, if you successfully complete the training program, we'll drop the charges and we'll give you a permanent supportive housing. So you'll never be on the street again because so many of these folks we'll are back. homeless. Yeah. Are homeless. So, yeah. but what the county never really thought through was that requires a fiscal subsidy. And the subsidy for the permanent supportive housing became extremely expensive. And the Board of Supervisors, after 2,200 placements, said, that's it. We are not going to support all this. And NAMI Greater Los Angeles County and myself personally have been advancing the idea of commingling permanent supportive housing funds for diversion programs. Why can't we take some Measure H or Measure HHH? And in particular, no place like home state funding designed for people with mental illness. You can legally use it for people who are justice involved. Let's pay for the permanent supportive housing piece with housing dollars and pay for treatment and services with the other revenue streams that are used. Mm -hmm. And the, so the county's trying to figure out, because ODR has about a $30 million shortfall. There's a structural deficit. And my exasperation with my county, who I was the biggest cheerleader for, because we were leading the nation in this, you know, and, and, and now – We've stopped doing it. I said, you can't, you can't go around saying we're a care first, jail's last county and shutter ODR and cap it. You know, you've got to solve the problem. Supervisors, this is your job. Figure out how to get your financial experts involved. Let's figure out how to fund this because we know it works. Right. And, and in that, in the two reports I've read about the challenges of closing men's central jail, they, they do reference multiple times that there needs to be a network of community-based treatment beds, but no description as to how those are going to be paid for until that is solved. And maybe that's a message for the, the new board that comes on, you know, after this election, that oh, yeah. there has to be a real strategy toward um, building out a, a, a continuum of beds in that whole from, you know, um, you know, acute needs, you know, to more independent needs. But we just seem to not have that that continuum of housing. We 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 have to solve the problem. We have to close men's central jail. Forget about m myself being a mental health advocate. Just as a tax paying citizen of the county, um, men's central jail is barbaric. It's mm -hmm. inhumane. It's not safe for inmates. It's not safe for sheriff deputies. It's not safe for staff. Oh, and the other thing you brought up is it's that go. people who are serving um, state prison sentences, the AB 109 uh, cohort, are also in L.A. County jail system. Well, it used to be if your sentence was more than a year, you went to state prison. If it was less than a year, you went to jail. Under something called public safety realignment in 2011, they changed it. So now if you commit a serious violent or sexual offense— you go to state prison, regardless of the how long the sentence is. If you commit a non-serious, non-violent, non-sexual offense, you do your time in the county jail. They realigned inmates because of the overcrowding, mm -hmm. because of the Supreme Court case, Plata versus Schwarzenegger, and we started with that. And uh, 
you know, to reduce the overcrowding from 176 percent of capacity down to 137 percent capacity. So the to to so what are you going to do? So the state threw money at the counties and said they're yours. Here's a check. And that was essentially AB 109 funding that comes. So now you could be sentenced for three or four years and you're doing your time in a county jail because you're one of the non-non-nons, right. the N3s, except you're in a facility that wasn't designed for long-term placement. Right. It's a short-term placement, a, a county jail. So um, there's different populations in the jail today than in the past. But the bottom line is we need – to solve the funding problem, uh, we need to bolster our pretrial services, our mental health treatment courts, and do the diversion that ODR was doing on the front end. They took reentry out of ODR and gave it to a new bureaucracy called JCOD, uh, Justice Care Opportunity Department, uh, JCOD. So they... And they kept the people with more serious clinical needs within the Office of Diversion and Reentry. But there's a catch there. JCOT's getting funded. ODR isn't. So what you ha- – again, unintended fiscal discrimination. People with serious mental illness are not getting funded. If you commit a crime and you're in jail and you have a serious mental illness and you need a, an appropriate diversion program for people with mental illness, you can't get one right now. So you, 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 as we were preparing for this talk over the couple meetings that we had, you, you asserted that, in your opinion, people with serious mental illness are among the most discriminated. We, we just discriminate against people with serious mental illness more than any other cohort in our society, that that is something you feel strongly about. Do you want to make that case? Yeah, I do. I think the and, – and I'll go back to the fist – inmates in our jail system. So the sickest of the sick, they're so sick they can't even go to court, right? There's 600 of them. So um, maybe half could, if we built a forensic IMD or some more community-based restoration programs instead of sitting in jail waiting for a bed in the state hospital, could we restore them to competency that way through the county? Yeah, we could. The doctors think, yeah, but there's another 300. No, they're Crimes are too severe and too heinous. They've got to go to the state hospital. The um, These are the forgotten people. These are the throwaway people. These are the people nobody wants to talk about unless it's your kid mm-hmm. who's in a high observation housing at Twin Towers, you know, or your dad or your loved one, you know, and, or it's you and you can't get out. But nobody else thinks about them. Uh, they're extremely expensive. You know, they cost the county a lot of money. Um, to me, this is one of the great civil rights issues of our times, where we take people who they're just too hard, they're just too challenging, they're just too sick. We don't know what to do with them. We're going to let them languish in jail. And advocates are, f- we're furious. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and 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 so it is a, an incredible civil rights issue. Yeah, and I view that as, like I said, I've, I've been spending time in at Twin Towers uh, every week since April, and I, I actually view the deputies who are working there are kind and compassionate. This is not what they signed up for. Um, they do the best they can. You know, this is on us as voters, as fellow human beings. This we are the ones who need to say this is not right. And press our elected officials, you know, to find the the community treatment, the support, the housing, the beds, the money to um, move people out of these very inhumane conditions. And, and here's why the people should care. Here's why the audience should care. Because when you have rampant sickness in the community, you know, we're all complain because there's homeless people everywhere now. They're in suburban areas. They're not just on Skid Row anymore. You know, people are complaining about this. You know, many of them do have a mental illness. They should be offered treatment and services so we can get them off the street and get them in housing. Um, if if you give people treatment and s- community services and re- supports, number one, it's the right thing to do. Number two, you uplift the level of community wellness. We're a better city. Mm-hmm. We're a better county. Mm-hmm. Um, it's also very expensive 
not to treat. What happens to all these folks? They're in emergency rooms all the time. They need crisis services. There's overdoses. All those expenses, you have people racking up half a million dollar, million dollar bills all the time. Uh, you know, homeless people are very expensive when you factor in the crisis services. It is much cheaper to provide housing and treatment and substance abuse treatment and medical care. And, you know, it, it, it's just something that we have to do. And when you think about all, I, I talked a lot about fiscal discrimination. Those are political decisions. They're not, you know, they weren't handed down from on high. Right. People in the legislature got together and made these funding choices, just the way in LA County we're making our funding choices. You know, and if and if it goes on for a few decades, one would think it starts to become an intentional choice. <laughs> <laughs> Something about the situation in right now would suggest that this is not working. Yes. So we do need to change. So And it saves money. It saves money. When yeah. when you do it right. Uh, Judge Stephen Leifman in Miami-Dade County said, why do we have all these horribly sick people? Pete Early, my friend Pete Early, wrote a book. Uh, crazy. Uh, crazy, mm -hmm. you know, uh, about his son and the, and the experience that he encountered uh, with his son, and uh, which is how we met because our kids were going through the same thing at the same time. And his experience at the Miami-Dade County Jail you know, Judge Leifman convinced the county bribed services and board and cares and treatment. He closed the jail. It saves $39 million a year. So there is a real incentive for the public to go, yeah, let's do this, because in the end, it does save the taxpayer money. So let's, um, we'll have to bring this to a close. Uh, I you, you brought up Pete Early, and that is an excellent book. I'll, I'll include a link to it in the episode notes and Great. Uh, the story with his son. Let's just finish with your son, because I know, it, 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 you know, he was staring at potential prison uh, yeah. term uh, early on, and, and he is in, a, in such a much better place right now. I think, tell us just that hopeful story of where he is right now. So people can and do recover every day mm -hmm. if they get the proper support that they need. Now, my my family situation is a little different because we really weren't county clients. We have private insurance, so we did this our, ourselves. Frankly, I had to be his caseworker. And, um, you know, parents have nowhere to turn. you got to do it yourself, right? To me, failure was him doing three to five in CDCR, in mm -hmm. prison. It, it would have changed his life forever. And um, there's something called anosognosia. It's a clinical term that means lack of insight. Mm -hmm. Essentially, you're too sick to know you're sick. And if you hear voices and have hallucinations and your psychosis, that is very real to you. And, um, you know, that is your reality. And so oftentimes people who experience psychosis, which is why care court was, is very much being focused on people who have psychotic symptoms, like schizophrenia, mm -hmm. uh, is to, to help them uh, gain insight. Because when my son turned about 26, 27, number one, there was the fatigue. I can't be on the street anymore. You know, I mean, he would not cooperate – Oh, my God, you know, after three, four months on the street, and finally he'd call me and say, Dad, help me. Mm. Uh, and I said, are you going to stop being abusive to the family? Yeah, I promise. You know, are you going to go back on your medication? I'll do whatever you want. I'll mm. go back on my meds. Mm. I, I can't help you if you don't go back on your meds. You know, are you going to stop stealing? You stop, you know, all these kinds of things that were going on. And um, when he would finally agree to it, Boom. You know, I found him, picked him up, put him in a motel that night, got him into programs, got him into treatment, called his doctor, got him his medication. And, you know, we did that every 90 days, you know, for t for 10 years. We went through 15 years of hell from age 13 through 27. But finally, he reached a point where he'd call me and say, I don't feel right. Mm -hmm. I think I need some help. Maybe... Mm -hmm. Maybe we should call the doctor. Mm. I should go to the hospital. Wow. He started asking for help. Wow. But my God, what we went through. Yeah. And look, I had to use involuntary treatment to get him there. All right. I had to send him to a locked school as a minor in Utah. Mm -hmm. 
his last, my son was hospitalized 10 different times, twice as a minor, eight as an adult. The last one really was his only 5150, where it was involuntary detainment. And, um, and we petitioned for an LPS conservatorship, and it was granted, and that saved his life because he couldn't fight it. It was too big. Mm-hmm. He couldn't say no anymore, mm-hmm. right? Because, and he, so he agreed to it because it created a structure where you could remove the chaos from life and all the things that go on on the street when he's running. And it created a structure where he could say, I can't do this anymore. And so he started agreeing to treatment. Well, he's 39 today. Mm. We moved from taking pills, which we found out was his big issue. I mean, I really got tired of being his medication probation officer. (laughs) Did you take your meds today? Did you take your meds today? So I'm a big proponent of what they call LAI, long-acting injectables. We put him, a, a doctor talked him into it when he was actually hospitalized before the conservatorship, where you get an injection every two weeks. We then went to an injection every month. And now he takes four injections a year, one a quarter. And we're lucky because the medicine works for him. Right, right. And so he stabilized. He has his own apartment. Other than some financial help from the family, he lives independently in, in the community. He's got some friends. Now, he will never be the next senator from California. He, I would love for him to have a full-time job. I don't think that's ever going to happen. Right. You know, he's never going to go back to college. You know, so when... I meet other parents and and their idea of success is, well, Joey just graduated from Yale, you know? (laughs) And my success story is my son can live independently in the community and he's not committing crimes anymore. He's not homeless anymore. Right. You know, and he stays on his medication. He's healthy and he's coming over for dinner. He's going to barbecue me a steak because he cooks a steak better than I can. Wow. And he's going to celebrate the holidays with the family. Do you have any idea... How many Hanukkahs and Christmases and birthdays we spent in psychiatric hospitals or in jail? You know, this is the story of my family. So now that we can come together and he's there, there was always somebody missing at our holiday table. So, God, yeah, it's this is success. Yeah. You know, I as I think about your story and I think about, like, what if we didn't have Mark Gale? Like, you know, like... What if we didn't have you? Because There's other people. It, well, There's lots of I people like me around the state. Uh, yeah, I well, can name them. Well, I know lots of great advocates. I know I've met a lot of people, but you know, mm-hmm. you you know, your your legacy, and I know you're you're not even done, but your legacy as a volunteer. I mean, you've been a volunteer. You have put this time in on your own and you've you've studied and you you're you're articulate and you show up um and you you've leveraged this you know, kind of just horrific experience you've had as a parent. And it's so heartwarming to hear how things are right now, but you've leveraged that for good. And, you know, Jackie Lacey and others have seen the value that you have played. So I am so grateful for how you, um, gosh, I I learn so much every time I talk to you. I know people, this is going to be one of those podcasts where people will call and say, I needed to listen to it three times to take notes because so much good information was shared. I just wish the county would put me out of business. (laughs) (laughs) Well, okay. Where I don't need to go to Zoom meetings anymore. I don't need to advocate. I don't need to start yelling to people about, you know, you need to find the political will to get this done. Right. Well, I'm going to I'm going to say that I'm feeling optimistic we're, you know, less than 60 days away from an election which is going to change a lot of things at our local level and even state and beyond. So I'm going to make sure that everyone who's running for office and everyone who's in office, I'm going to personally deliver this podcast for them to listen to. So Mark, thank you. I'll never you. get invited to another meeting again. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I'm already on, on well, It's the like list. Congressman jo- John Lewis used to talk about getting in good trouble. Yeah, so, right. So that's you, Mark Gale. Thank you so much for being here today on, and cl- helping me close down season three of Heart Forward. And thank you for having me, Carrie. It's All great right. to see you. Again. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Mark and I went into this conversation with the intent to inform, not to advocate for a particular position or policy. I hope you find yourself curious now to do a deeper dive on some of the public policy issues that surfaced in this discussion. 
Once the dust settles with our upcoming election in LA County and city, and we know the cast of leadership characters that will be in place to tackle many of the issues raised in this conversation, I hope you will feel better prepared to stay informed, ask questions, and query, how can we do better for our fellow human beings? This represents the final episode of the season three of this podcast. I'm gonna take a break and resume early in 2023. For the past two seasons, I've used this sign-off message as a time to date stamp, actually, where we are in the world. So it's mid-September in Los Angeles, and we have weathered severe heat over the past several weeks, and we are now confronting the realities of a severe drought. And weather patterns seem increasingly weird in other parts of the world. Hence, it is hard to deny the reality that hashtag climate change is real. COVID deaths have exceeded 1 million people in the United States, and COVID exhaustion is real. Queen Elizabeth will be buried next week, and the war in Ukraine seems to have taken a turn with Ukrainians pushing a counteroffensive against the Russian invaders. We are less than two months away from elections, local, state, and federal, in a country where polarization feels palpable. Still, we press on. Standing still is not an option. Thank you for listening. Please support this podcast by reviewing it, sharing it on your social media, and donating via our website at heartforwardla.com. I've been grateful to have access to this in-person studio space at Verdugo Sound in the Glassell Park neighborhood of Los Angeles. Thank you to Aaron Stern and his team who have supported me for these several months of interviews. I will see you in the new year.